that was a great session. And don't you just feel like you want to get in contact with Thierry and pitch him a game right now? I think you should do that. You should definitely do that. And it's great to see that they are making some fantastic games and discovering games all across Africa. Uh, that's Spielfabrik doing that good work right here on the continent. So right now, Exola will take the stage and Justin's going to outline how you can launch, monetize and scale with Exola. They are our international headline sponsor. So it's a huge thank you to them for giving us the ability to put on Africa Games Week. We needed their support to make this happen. They are putting a huge amount of energy into our industry. So there are definitely people that we want to be listening to. Justin, over to you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Game Industry Overview presented by me, Justin Berenbaum. Uh, it's going to be a high level, mostly numbers presentation, taking you through the current state of the game business and where we think it's going over the next several years. Uh, I hope you find at least some of this information useful. And uh, I'm always happy to answer questions later on. I'm pretty easy to find. So let's get into it. First, uh, I'd like to thank Africa Games Week for having us here and uh, allowing us to give this presentation. A few of the topics I'm covering, um, getting started, I'll just be some brief, real short information. Then it's by the numbers. And when I say by the numbers, I mean lots and lots of numbers. Uh, a little bit about funding and some things that we're working on here. And then my crystal ball, where I take a few guesses about what's going to be happening in, in the future of games, at least in the short term future. So let's get right into it. Um, getting started. For me, getting started was a rather strange and, and interesting path in the industry. Um, in college, I worked at restaurants. I was an ice man. Yes, I actually delivered big bags of ice to grocery stores and restaurants and things like that. Uh, I was an intern in a music industry magazine, and this is where I met the folks in these pictures, which I'll go into a little bit later. I was a radio DJ and music director. And after college, I worked for a record label. I worked in the financial industry selling mutual funds and life insurance. I was a temp for a high-end camera company, the type of cameras you used to use in film and TV production. And then I started my career in games by answering an ad in the newspaper. And that ad in the newspaper was actually for a retail store manager for a company called G&G Software. That company happened to be owned by Capcom. I interviewed with the CFO and the president, and I was given the option to go work at a retail store, which I guess would be closer to a, a GameStop or, or a game, uh, or go work at the corporate office and build out the mail order division. I took that role, and that was kind of the start of my career. And for those of you watching who probably don't know the people in the pictures, the upper left one is me with Chuck D from Public Enemy, and the upper right one is me with Ice-T, who is now in Law and & Order and has been for a long time uh, and is actually a really cool guy. And the bottom picture is of one of my platinum albums from Naughty by Nature. What does this really have to do with gaming? Not a lot except that you never really know where your path's going to take you. Uh, I loved games from when I was little, and I always wanted to get into the business somehow, and I kind of accidentally stumbled in. So uh, not necessarily a direct path, but quite an interesting one. I mentioned uh, Capcom, which is where I got my start. Uh, I then spent a little over seven years at Activision doing all the outbound licensing and business development. Spent about four plus years at 505 Games, and then I consulted for Team 17 for almost a year. Uh, in between, I worked for technology companies, I consulted for developers, and a whole bunch of other fun, interesting little things. But most of my career has been at publishers or with developers or consulting for developers. So let's get into the numbers. Uh, and like I said, there's going to be lots and lots of numbers. So I apologize if you're bored by numbers, you can probably zone out and come back in a little bit and watch this stuff uh, on funding and pitching. So uh, I will start with a little look back. In 2019, game, games generated more revenue than music and movies combined. I don't think this is a surprise to anybody probably watching this talk or in the industry. Uh, 152 billion, roughly, in revenue for the game industry, which was up roughly 9.6%. Music and movies combined was uh, almost 120 billion. So a good 20% more than music and movies combined. And why do I say that? I say that now because that gap is gonna be much bigger in 2020. Uh, our industry, as most people know, continues to grow at a rather crazy, ridiculous pace. 
So 2020 looks good. Uh, and I say well, because I actually have an updated slide on the next slide that makes it look really good. So this slide was actually at the very beginning of the year. And these were predictions from New Zoo on what the market was going to be this year. And their prediction was $159 billion, which is a 9.3 year over year increase, which is still an amazing increase when you consider the size of the industry. Um, you can see the breakdown a little bit mobile at 77 billion and console. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this slide because it's been adjusted significantly given the, uh, the, the pandemic and how our numbers have changed. So in eight or nine months, the numbers went from 159 billion to this, 174.9 billion. So roughly $15 billion increase or roughly 14% increase uh, from what the original prediction was in nine months. Uh, and you can see this, uh, this one happens to be broken down by the global market. And this has always felt this one was interesting, uh, especially given the audience for this. Um, and this goes into a little bit of what I'm talking about, about where the market is going and where it's going to be growing. So uh, Asia Pacific, which uh, would incorporate China, was 84.3 billion, 17% year over year growth. North America had a 21% year over year growth. Latin America had a 25% year over year growth. Europe, almost 20%. The Middle East and Africa, 30%. Uh, so I think this chart is pretty timely and just shows how much and how big the industry is, but where it actually has opportunities to grow. And I believe the Middle East and Africa is one of those markets. I actually believe some other regions of Southeast Asia are huge opportunities as well. Let's look at the platform breakdown. A lot of people think that the market is almost all mobile uh, and they're not wrong. The mobile market is huge. The mobile market makes up uh, roughly 50% of the total game market and has had a 25% year over year growth, which is phenomenal. Uh, PC, who everybody has thought has been dead for decades, has still been growing at a 6.2% year-over-year growth. Now, the thing is, it's actually hurt slightly by browser PC games have actually decreased by about 7%. So the PC market, if you don't take out the fact that browser games have declined, would have grown even more. Um, and then there's other, you see the console markets, $50 billion, uh, and and more. So I think the idea here is that the market is huge, growing. We know mobile is growing, but console, PC, and other platforms are also all growing rapidly. So if you're looking for uh, platforms to develop on, pick the platform that's going to show off your game the best. Don't just pick the one you think that is the biggest, like mobile. So let's take a look at the global games forecast. And this one was also done at the beginning of the year. And the forecast you can see was the old one at 159 billion. And you can see that 2021 was supposed to be at 174 billion. The reality is, is that we're gonna be at 174 billion this year. So we're about a year ahead of schedule in terms of global revenue. So the old forecast had us at 8.3% compounded adjusted growth rate. The new one has us at a 9.4. And this chart has us going to about 217, roughly 220 billion by 2023. Uh, again, I think we're the only market that's seeing this kind of growth anywhere in the only industry. Uh, and I will say that, thank goodness, we're all in games right now. Uh, the big thing, and this is always when everybody pulls out their crystal ball and makes big predictions, that people are saying, if we keep growing like we're growing, the industry could be roughly 300 billion by 2025. I don't know if it's going to quite get there, but it could. And this is a good place to be. Uh, success is still hard to find, but this market is fantastic. And I can tell you, there's a lot of people looking to get into this market. I'll go into that a little bit more later. As you can see, this is broken down by year. Um, you can see the growth for even PC and MMO is continuing to grow rapidly. Casual web games is about the only thing that's not growing very quickly and handheld. Um, console is still growing, tablets growing, and obviously smartphone is growing incredibly quickly. So let's talk a little bit about some of the numbers from Q2. Q2 is April 1 to June 30th of this year. And the reason I'm highlighting this is one is the most of the full numbers aren't in for Q3. And there's just some crazy things that happened in Q2. So Nintendo was up 541%. And that's not revenue. That is net profit. 
So 541%, I believe, is the record of any company in our industry, probably ever, unless it's a startup. Take two was up 54%. Zynga was up 47. Activision, 37. Capcom, 32. Sony, 32. Electronic Arts, 21. Ubisoft, up 18. And that's just the public companies. We don't know what some of the private companies like Epic, uh, Unity before they went public and some of these others were doing, but you can assume they were all doing really well also. So another indicator of how well this uh, medium is doing, how well games have been doing, the number of hours of gaming watched by platform. Twitch, that number is looks like 5,066, except when you find out that's in the millions. Five billion hours of gaming were watched on Twitch in Q2. YouTube had 1.5 billion hours. Facebook had 822 million hours. And Mixer had 106 million hours, although we know Mixer is no longer with us. They're actually with Facebook. So if you combine those two, almost a billion. So in total, roughly 7.5 billion hours of game content watched in one quarter alone. Quickly, and again, this slide is just to illustrate how big and how widespread our market's gotten. 82% of global consumers played video games and watch video game content during the height of the pandemic. So the initial lockdown, uh, April through June, saw the numbers go to ridiculous heights. Um, this one is more meaningful for me, and this is monthly worldwide digital game revenue. Keep in mind, this does not take into account retail. Uh, retail obviously had a slowdown because people couldn't go to stores, but then picked back up significantly. And those numbers are obviously go through the roof with the launch of the new hardware. But you can see February had a bit of a dip, and then things jumped like crazy. March, April, May, June, had, June, July had a dip, and that's normal for summer, although it shot back up in August, and I believe that trend line continues to go up and up in uh, September, October, November, and December. So this was a slide that I actually just added yesterday because it just came out a couple of days ago, and this is just a little bit of a visualization, and I love my visuals of the kind of change in the landscape of the market since basically 1972. So it covers almost 50 years of gaming. Um, the important thing to see is the poor arcade business, which is that dark blue line in the, in the middle, how that kind of disappeared in the, in the mid to late 90s and, and is, is trickled to almost nothing. Um, and obviously I think that was making a comeback with location-based gaming, but all that will be on hold until the pandemic goes by. You can see the console landscape, um, you know, in, in 85 was the huge crash. And then you had another one a little bit in the early nineties, but since then the console gaming landscape has been growing and growing and growing. You can still see though, everybody says, oh, PC gaming's dead. PC is still bigger than console at least according to this. And then you can see the unbelievable growth of mobile, um, you know, starting in the late 90s with little simple games up to now, that huge red line, and it just continues to grow astronomically. You see handheld had its heyday probably in the 2000s uh, and, and is withered off. Although I would argue the Switch is also a handheld, although I believe here it's considered a console. Um, you can see cloud and VR, but they make up very little piece in the market so far. So that is a quick run through of a whole lot of numbers. Uh, hoping I didn't bore anybody too much. I tried to go through it quickly uh, and just cover some highlights. Again, uh, feel free to reach out to me um, via social media after this if you want to delve into more detailed specific questions. Um, a little bit more numbers just quickly by category. And again, this is August. Um, September numbers are out but I didn't have a chance to put those together. Um, the highlight on here I wanna point out is the different titles on different platforms and what's done well where. You can see that Fortnite has done well on PC and console, but obviously dropped off on the mobile because of what's going on with the fight with Apple. Um, Roblox is on there for mobile as well as PC. Uh, but I want to point out the number one in PC is Fall Guys. Now, I won't call that studio in, an indie studio technically. It's well over 100 people working for it. But uh, I believe that most people would assume that kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, I'll spend a little bit more time on that later. But this is just to highlight um, the kind of major consoles, the games that are doing well, some games you may have not heard of, most of which you probably heard of. But you know, the, the outlier here may be Valorant. 
in fall guys uh, in particular are something I don't think most people expected. So let's talk a little bit about funding. I'm not sure how many here are uh, hoping to attend this and learn more about funding. I didn't spend a ton of slides on funding because I wanted to do high level. Uh, I'm happy to dig way more into this later. I've done several other talks on gaming and funding. Um, so let's talk about game revenue investor spend. This is a, a big thing for me. I keep a close eye on the community and what's going on with investors in our uh, industry. So digital game revenue left 11% in 2018. And I apologize, I don't have 2019 numbers. The same source we got these from in 2018 has disappeared, but I'm still putting these here to give you an idea. Uh, premium game revenue rose 10% in 2018, keeping in mind that it's not just free to play revenue that's growing up. Premium game revenue is also going up. Uh, 2018 investors spent $5.7 billion on game developers. And another reason I'm pointing this out is I have numbers from 2020 that will be absolutely staggering in a minute. And it's twice what they invested in 2017. So again, keep in mind, in 2017, investors spent about two and a half to three billion on game developers, and it doubled in 2018. So now let's talk about game revenue and investor spend continued. What does it look like this year? In Q2 2020 alone, Total game investments were 7.8 billion. A couple of the biggest were Net, NetEase and Peak Games, and that's three times the 2.55 billion in Q1. Keep in mind that 7.8 billion is also a little over 2 billion more than all that was spent in 2018. In Q3, Epic raised another 1.78 billion for a valuation of 17.3 billion. Q3, Unity filed for an IPO and went public at $52 a share. As of today, the end of the day, it's basically at $152 per share. And that puts our market valuation at $41.2 billion. You can understand why the industry is doing so well. You can also see why all the ind industries are paying attention to what's going on in gaming and why so many people are interested in how do I get into this business and this market. Uh, again, I'll talk a little bit more about that and why there's so much money trying to get in the market now. <laughs> Lastly, Q4 recently, Roblox filed to go public. This is one I would keep a close eye on. I believe their uh, their public offering will be really hot. I don't know if it's going to be as hot as Unity and Triple in the matter of a month and a half, but uh, it's definitely something to keep an eye on because there's a lot of people that want to invest in games, and this will be one of the first companies after Unity to go public in the space. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the not so secret to success when you are, are pitching or selling your game or when you're trying to get press and attention. And this goes all back to when you're trying to get funding in particular, uh, you need to get people's attention. So you need to get the press, influencers, investors, the publishers, you need to get their time. Uh, and the reason you need to get their time, if they don't give you their time, you definitely can't get their money. So it's really important, not only that you get their attention, but you keep it long enough where they might give you their money. In this case, it could be pitching to investors or it could be the press, or at the end of the day, it's gonna be consumers. And why are they gonna choose your product or your game over the thousands of other games out there? Um, the reference may not make sense for the, the, the GIF I put in there or the automated taco machine, but when I was working on this last time, I was really hungry. And we have a thing here in the States called Taco Tuesday. Uh, and I was working on this on a Tuesday. So I apologize for anybody who thinks this was really stupid. It is pretty stupid, but I couldn't resist. Um, I also want to talk quickly just about the pitch. And, and one of the things I think it is most important when pitching anybody, uh, and that's to clearly communicate your vision. The images you see on the screen here are from a game called Abzu by Matt Nava and a studio called Giant Squid. They actually just released another game called The Pathless. The reason I am showing these images is I met Matt Nava in a hotel in Culver City where he pitched his game. He didn't have a, uh, he didn't have a game playable. He didn't have a whole lot. He had a bunch of artwork, some moon music, and then took me through his vision for what the game was going to be like and what the player was going to experience. I walked out of that room with such a clear understanding of what the game was supposed to be, how the player was going to play through it, what they were probably going to feel uh, that we literally called a meeting the next day to bring him in to pitch to the entire company because we believed in the game so much. So this is again, one of the probably two or three games I've ever signed that were just kind of on pen and paper. Um, but 
Matt also had the background to back it up, having worked on Journey and Flower, and he had Austin Wintry already agreed to compose the soundtrack. So when you walk in the door or something like that, it's hard not to sign it. Even then, it was one of only a handful that we've ever signed that was just pen and paper, keeping in mind that most of the people out there pitching at least have a build or in a gameplay video when they're pitching to investors. I want to talk quickly about this being a creative hit driven business. Um, our CEO firmly believes you never know where the next big hit's going to come from. Uh, and so I have a few examples here, of course. Great games can emerge from anywhere is our philosophy, which is why Exola spends so much time everywhere, attending shows everywhere, talking to developers everywhere, because you never know where that next great game is going to come from. Uh, I talk a little bit about this untitled goose game. We joke that who would have thought for six months that people would be talking about a goose that's a jerk, um, but everybody was. We all know Among Us and the hit that's become, even though that's been out for a while, it managed to just rocket to success and fame recently. And then, of course, we talked about Fall Guys. And the reason I want to bring Fall Guys up again, it had the highest earning launch of any PC game since Overwatch. Keep in mind, this is a small studio going up against Blizzard and a $185 million launch on PC alone. This doesn't take into account what they did on console not too shabby for a independent developer with a independent publisher uh, in, in a big business. So I got to give my hats off to everybody and you know, I put on this list, but in particular, the team over at Mediatonic and Devolver for this one. So let's talk a little bit about Funding Club. I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Funding Club because that's one of my pet projects and something I firmly believe in. What is it? Exola Funding Club is a no-cost matchmaking service that connects developers with investors so they can receive funds to finish, launch, and market their game. The, this project launched or soft launched at PAX East in 2019. It moved to beta phase uh, later on in 2019. We had 28 investors October 2019. We had 53 in August, so about nine months later. And as of the end of November, we're sitting at 75 investors. Now, when I say investors, that's investors and small to medium-sized publishers that make that up. And they're all sitting in this club waiting to see great pitches. So I bring this up because we would like folks that have games that are ready to be pitched, meaning they have a pitch deck, a build, and a gameplay video to consider submitting to Funding Club. It's no cost to the developer, no cost to the investor, and it's just an opportunity to get your game in front of a bunch of potential investors that you might not ever meet anywhere else, in particular right now. The uh, website is right there, exola.com slash funding. Uh, that's it for the pitch on that. Quickly, I want to go over the estimated developer budgets we're seeing. I don't know how accurate this is for the different regions that you may or may not be in, but keeping in mind that uh, this is mostly independent developers submitting. So you can see that very few games that are under 300, under 100,000, uh, about 30% are in the one to 3 million range, about 30% in the 200 and 500. So you can see the breakdown uh, and only about 12% are over 3 million. Um, so if you're working on a game and it's somewhere in this range, that really does mean you're probably indie uh, and we would probably love to take a look and hopefully we can introduce you to an investor that would be interested in your project. That's it. I'm going to talk about that's the only sales pitch you're going to get from me uh, and a no cost sales pitch at that. Um, quickly, I'm going to talk about my crystal ball, um, kind of my vision for what's happening and what's going to be happening. Keep in mind that I actually did this portion of the talk, my crystal ball talk in March or April, uh, and I haven't changed it since then. So some of these may seem a little dated, but I wanna kind of check myself and see how accurate I was. So my predictions, the good, game revenue, game play time, game viewing all way up, digital is dominating. Who, the World Health Organization endorses gaming to make it even more socially acceptable. And this is kind of funny and ironic because about a year before this, they said that there was a gaming addiction disorder and labeled it and basically made it taboo in some places to play games. They are now endorsing it. Um, so I just point this out because I actually find it pretty funny. Uh, the bad, we all know world economy is in a global recession. A lot of people are out of work. A lot of people are struggling right now and money has gotten tight. 
due diligence was hard, extremely difficult now. And for those who aren't sure what due diligence it is, is it's when an investor or a publisher is looking to invest or publish a game, generally you end up meeting in person with the developer. Usually you go to the development studio, meet with the staff, take a look at what they're working on and spend a lot of time with the team before you actually decide to sign them. That's really impossible now. So it's hard to build trust and especially hard to build trust virtually. So those deals are taking much longer if they are happening at all. Uh, we're talking about game delays, submissions taking longer, uh, lot check, all those have been slowed way down. QA is taking longer. As you've seen already, Halo has been delayed. Cyberpunk's been delayed a couple times. We'll have to see if it actually shifts before Christmas. The WoW expansion's been delayed and more, and I would not be surprised to see even more AAA games delayed, especially big games are hard to do when everybody's working remotely. The great. Normally I put this the good, the bad, and the ugly from one of my favorite Clint Eastwood movies, but there's not a lot of ugly when it comes to games. So the great, rapidly growing market globally, as I showed earlier, the value for money. So cost per hour of entertainment is really a bargain, which is why you're seeing so many people spending what little disposable income they have on games. It keeps people safe, it keeps them home, and the cost per hour of entertainment is relatively low compared to other forms of entertainment. And there's lots of money from other sectors need somewhere to go, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll talk that, about that one more time in a second. So some opportunities. Money still needs somewhere to go, as I said. Uh, the term is a content desert, and what I mean by that is movie, TV, and other production was shut down or stopped for nearly six months. Late next year, there's going to be a huge hole in content pipelines for companies movie companies, TV companies, et cetera, they're gonna be really far behind and really short on content. What does that mean? It means more opportunities for games and other mediums. Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, et cetera, are all looking at games, game IPs, and signing those to do TV shows and spinoffs and do other things. It's a great opportunity to bring our medium to more consumers and legitimize the industry even more than it already is. Game engines are being used more and in multiple sectors, you're seeing Unreal and even Unity starting to be used in cars, showrooms, movies, TVs, et cetera. And especially now it's been accelerated because you can use these engines to do a lot of content and not have to film in person and put people at risk. New business models are gonna change and the growth of subscription services that most of you have probably seen. Uh, Xbox Game Pass are moving into Game Pass Ultimate, Apple Arcade. Uh, I put Stadia with a question mark because I'm not sure um, if Stadia is going to be around in a year or two unless they do something different. The big loser right now in the console war happens to be Stadia because nobody's talking about them. Uh, so we'll really have to see what they can come up with. There's a lot of really great, really smart people over there, um, but they're going to have to do something pretty drastic to get the attention of people right now. Uh, the other opportunity, subscriptions for individual games, developers, publishers, you're starting to see a lot of that. Mobile games are starting to do month-long subscriptions or recurring subscriptions. Uh, a lot of developers are doing you know, subscriptions to stuff. There's battle passes. We're going to see more and more and more of that as a way to make predictable recurring revenue. Talented teams that know how to finish. So if you're a team that's worked on things either separately or together and you know how to complete projects, that's in high demand. There is a huge amount of people looking to have content made that need to go people they know can finish. So teams with experience will be in demand if they ship something. And like I said, new emerging markets will pop up. I mentioned that uh, the APAC region has a lot of room to growth and so does the Middle East and Africa. And I believe those markets are really up and coming and, and developers and publishers should really pay close attention to those markets. So, some quick, I'm gonna kind of leave you on some general advice that I have that I try to try to give to folks um, both in the industry and outside the industry trying to get in, do your homework. If you're pitching a publisher, you're pitching an investor, make sure you spend a little bit of time looking the person you're meeting with and do research on what type of games they've funded or published and, and what they've had success or failure with. Just like a job interview. So when you do your uh, when you do your homework for a job interview, same for pitching a game, pitching who you're pitching, what you're pitching to, what they're interested in, and if they're not interested in your project, who might be interested. Never 
hurts to ask them at the end of the pitch if they say they're not interested if they know somebody else who might i've sent a lot of developers on to other publishers when i wasn't interested or i couldn't sign their stuff meeting with somebody new uh, i have to ask this question how many of you actually took a few seconds to look me up and, and figure out who i was before you attended uh just spend five minutes doing your homework again Relationships matter. If I can leave you with anything from this whole talk besides how big the industry is, the most important thing any of us have in this career, in this industry is relationships, and they matter immensely. They're the only things you take with you when you leave school or a job, you're asking for introductions, and contacts matters. Frame the request. So if you have a relationship or a connection that can introduce you to somebody, always use that first. If you're reaching out to somebody new and you've never met them before, or you're requesting connection even on LinkedIn, frame it with context. When I get blank LinkedIn requests with no context and I have no reason or no idea who these people are, it makes it really hard for me to accept them. Somebody reaches out and says, I heard your talk. I saw this. I have a game to pitch. Would you connect? As long as there's context, I will accept those connections. The same goes through email or whatever. If you're reaching out to somebody for the first time, try to provide context and you're more likely to get a response. That's really it for my general advice. I hope uh, hope that most of this went really quickly and was something useful for most of you. And that's really about it for my talk. Uh, at the end, I want to thank you again. Thanks to uh, Games Week Africa. Um, my Twitter is at SC Slug. I'm really easy to find. And there's my LinkedIn. So feel free to connect with me if you watch this. Just make sure that you put context in there and you let me know that, hey, I watched your talk. I'd like to connect with you. And again, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, I'd be happy to try to answer it there. Uh, and the reason Yoda is here is my nickname is Dark Yoda because I'm short, bald, old, and, and you don't generally want to mess with me because I have a mean streak. Um, that's it. Thanks again. Uh, hopefully this was interesting. And uh, I'll look forward to meeting you all in person someday when we can. Thanks again.